Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we start, before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. How y'all doing, ladies? Good, how are you? Man, You're it's been a while. In town today. Yeah, I know. I've been I've been all over the world literally for the past two months and uh and and you know I've even missed a couple missed the episode. So I'm back. Good to see your smiling faces, and we got an awesome guest uh today. No, we do. So Kiana, without further ado, please introduce today's guest. Today's guest is a longtime actor who plays Corbell Pickett in Prime Video's new science fiction series, The Peripheral. He also played Evan, Rachel Wood's father in HBO's Westworld, and played Deputy Andy Broom for five seasons on Murder, She Wrote, starring the late and great Angela Lansbury. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Lewis Hertham. Hey. Good morning. Hey, good morning. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Oh, okay. it's a little I'm earlier here, but uh, than where you are. But uh, I'm good. no. It's, good it's a morning. pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, you said it's a little early. You got your coffee. Where, where you at right now? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. Los Angeles, a little bit closer to the ocean. Okay. Gotcha. So we'd like to start off yeah, by telling you how day. you tell us about the peripheral and your character Corbell Pickett. So can you give us a bit more information on the series and what it's about? Sure. Uh, well, it's based on a novel by William Gibson of the same name, The Peripheral. <clears throat> and it it, uh, it involves two timelines. Um, I work in the timeline of basically 2030. So it's a little bit ahead, a little bit of future for those of us today. Um, it takes place in a very small, fictitious town called Clanton, North Carolina. My character, Corbell Pickett, is sort of the guy that sort of runs the town, kind of owns it. Uh, he's probably not the um, most scrupulous guy around, but uh, he's worked his way up to this uh, place of power. And in that community is a brother and sister, uh, Flynn and Burton Fisher, and they are gamers and they play ga these virtual reality games for corporations and they get paid quite a bit of money to do so. Well, there's a new game that is sent to them with a headset and this, this one's very different. It actually projects their consciousness into the year 2100 and from there it gets kind of crazy that's the basic <laughs> idea the first the first two episodes are available now on uh amazon prime or prime video and for the next six fridays they'll add another uh episode so this this coming friday uh will be episode three and so on and just like you mentioned so the series premiered just a few days ago What's the reaction been like so far? Well, the reaction has been stupendous. Uh, it it has taken over the number one position on Prime Video, um, so people seem to be enjoying it. The you know the the main thing is to have the uh, to have the the people that that watch that you know they're they're the barometer really on how well the show is doing um it's a complicated show the book is really really deep and quite complicated the show is not quite as as much it's more easily explained so if anybody's read the book and go oh man you know is is it going to be that deep and that dense it yeah. it is more easily understood but it is still i mean there are people now going i love the show i don't know what's going on but i love it because they are they, obviously we have to leave, you know, they have to leave some some mystery and there's quite a bit of that. But the but the response from the viewing public has been fantastic. So so how much of, of your of your life uh, or how much did you embrace VR 
uh, prior to kind of doing this role uh, in your life? <laughs> not not a lot. Uh, I, I got my daughter uh, an Oculus, I think you call it. Um, yeah. Last Christmas or was it Christmas before Christmas before? And um, she didn't really care much for it. Uh, so <laughs> I tried it out. Uh, I did a couple of the games, the shooting games, because they're fun. Uh, like you're on a roller coaster and you're shooting things as they go by. And it's pretty trippy, but I, it, it, uh, I mean, it made, it made me dizzy, it made me quite dizzy uh, at first. So I've had very little, it's not something I do very often. I pull that thing out. She left it. She left it here. She didn't even take it home. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm not knocking it. Virtual reality is yeah. amazing. It really is. But it's, uh, you know, to, I, you know, different strokes for different folks. But um, yeah. now if I could do the virtual reality that is exists in this show, that's a whole different ball game. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think my vertigo allowed me to do VR because uh, I yeah, I don't, I don't want to get too too trippy. <laughs> but, well, um, when I when I finish, when I take the thing off, I my head's spinning a little bit. It really is. It it definitely it definitely affects me at least. Yeah, the 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 older I get, the lower risk I try to take in life, and I, I think virtual reality <laughs> is is one of those risks where I, I assess the risk, and I'm like, you know what? I think I'm good. I totally understand that. <laughs> so, uh. Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, they, who created, who co-created Westworld, are executive producers on the Peripheral. Um, how did working with them on Westworld lead to you working on the new series? Well, I guess it would it would be it directly affected my working on this show. Um, <clears throat> when I was cast in Westworld, I I really was only cast as um, a guest star in the pilot episode, um, but after after we shot the pilot, there was a delay to see if HBO was going to pick up the show because they didn't get a straight to uh, straight to production kind of deal. They, they did the pilot and then Westworld, uh, rather HBO looked at the pilot and picked it up. So then they called me back and gave Peter more things to do. And then after season one, they uh, gave me a whole another season. So that really that one episode turned into two seasons two two years of, of work on westworld and i really believe that they were trying to find ways to keep peter around and something i'm very grateful for to them but i knew that my ride as peter was coming to an end because of the way my character uh ended in the show so whenever you do these contracts there's a timeline and there's a specific to whether you're continuing with the show and knew the date. Um, I don't remember. I have a crazy memory for dates. It was June 10th, 2018. And so I was expecting the call. Lisa gave, got, gave me the call. She, you know, she's a lovely, lovely, lovely person. Both she and John are just amazing people. They truly are. And she said, um, you know, well, I think we've gone about as far as we can with Peter and I thanked her. She thanked me and she said, but we sold the new show. And when we get that thing going, we like to talk to you about it. She didn't mention the show or anything, but she just said that. And three years later, I got the call and they offered me Corbell Pickett. No, that's the first time in 40 years. I want to, I, excuse me, uh, Kiana, but the first time in 40 years that someone has actually said something like that and followed through with it. Oh, wow. Because wow. as actors, you hear that all the time. Uh, yeah, the work, Hollywood talk, right? Again. Yeah, man. Yeah, we get it all the time. <laughs> no, but playing Peter seemed like a very challenging role. So how did you prepare for the physical and emotional challenges of that character? Well, let's see. Okay, the physical part, uh, I auditioned for the show. I, I got really my my manager called me and said, you, we have an audition for you for Westworld. And I went, what are they doing the movie? And he goes, no, it's going to be a TV series. And I was like, wow, because I saw that movie in 73, you know, when it first came out and it was so, uh, so ahead of its time, so futuristic, but I loved it. And so I was very excited about it. 
my first audition was with uh, the casting associate, Deanna Brigitte, who is John Papsidero's uh, associate. And you, I, was, I read for a different part. I didn't read for Peter. I read for a different part, but every, I, I guess, I, I don't know if the women had to do it as well, but every male had to do um, basically the scene that you see me do, that Peter does with, with Anthony Hopkins, with Dr. Ford at the end of the pilot. Uh, the dialogue was different, the characters were different, but it was basically Dr. Ford putting a host through this diagnosis. So I did that um, in the first audition and she said, okay, I want you to come back for the producers, but I want you to come up with some sort of physical activity that shows this, this, uh, this host having, you know, really bad issues. And I said, well, do you want, do the, do we want these robots to be like, as in the movie, you could tell they were robots. They were a little stiff. There was just enough to where she goes, no, there's no difference between humans and these hosts, except when he is glitching and going from one to the other character. And I went, okay. And then she gave me the best, the best um, uh, note, I guess, that any casting director has ever giving, given me. She said, you know, when your computer gets the little spinning ball and I went, oh yeah, I hate that. She goes, that's what's happening to you. And I went, wow, that, okay. You're just trying to pull it together. So I, um, I came home, I had about a week or maybe four or five days before I had to go back in. And I just started trying to come up with something that would be different because everybody, she even said, people will be like, you know, and I'm like, yeah, everybody's going to be doing that. So. <laughs> and then it dawned on me, it dawned on me that he's not only trying to physically get, get it together, <clears throat> pardon me, he's also trying to vocally speak. So I came up with this <laughs> kind of thing where he's trying to speak and I don't know why, but that just brought everything together. And just, I put that with the, the physicality of it. So I went in, did the, the audition. Lisa Joy literally said, that was freaking awesome. And she said, do, do you have anything else you want to show us? And I was so pleased that it went so well. I, I literally said, I, I think I'll quit while I'm ahead, but thanks. <laughs> and, uh, but it was weeks, it was five weeks or so before I had kind of forgotten about it. And then I got the role and yeah. Uh, so the, then the physicality of it right before I, I think a few days, actually they added three pages to that scene two days before I shot it. And I, I had gone in and with just Jonah, Lisa and myself, and we ran through the scene a couple of times and I did it full bore with the physicality. And it is, it's exhausting because you, when you, to do that, you basically are tensing every muscle, at least I did every muscle in your body to get that kind of, that kind of movement, jerky kind of movement. So that's basically how I prepared for it. And um, I stay in fairly good physical condition. So the physicality of it was, uh, was actually fun. It was, but it was a workout. When I left, we shot that scene all day. It was actually eight pages. It turned out to be about five pages on camera. But I went home that night and I was completely exhausted, but com just absolutely euphoric because it was one of the uh, pinnacles of my career doing that scene with Sir Anthony Hopkins, who, by the way, likes to be called Tony. He's a pretty down to earth guy. <laughs> True. Well, well, it sounds like you uh, you channeled your inner inner circle of death is what we call it in the computer world. Uh, which, <laughs> you know, the whole Max Hedrum thing that you were doing. It kind of reminds me of that, that old Max, Max Hedrum commercial. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you also spent five seasons uh, playing Deputy Andy Broom on Murder She Wrote, uh, mm -hmm. and five seasons with the legendary uh, Angela Lansbury. And you wrote this beautiful tribute to her yeah. on Facebook uh, after her recent death. So how special was it to work with her? Mm. Well, that was first of all that was my first kind of big break. The first time I, I was able to do uh, a major show, you know, over a long period of time. Angela, they, what I said in there, they'll never be another like her. And 
that is most likely a very true statement. She was just one of the, well, when people asked me what Angela was like, I said, just exactly like you think she's like, because she was very much like Jessica Fletcher. She was just sweet, kind, caring, uh, regal. I, I, I think I said, and uh, someone else asked me about, I did another short interview that uh, a friend asked me to do. And he said, what was it like being on set with her? And I, I said, it was kind of like when she would come on set, it was kind of like the queen coming on, on set and not because of anything that she did, not because of anything, any, you know, pretentious thing that she would do is just that she demanded this enormous amount of respect just because she was such an extraordinary person, an extraordinary actor, extraordinary talent. Um, I mean, so it, it was one of the privileges, again, of my career. I, I've been very fortunate to work with some really amazing people. And so that was that was quite a blow. She actually passed on the 11th of October, which uh, at 96, but on the 16th of October, which is her birthday, she would have turned 97. So she was only five days short, shy of 97. And then nine days later, uh, we get the word that my dear friend and colleague, Ron Masak, who played the sheriff, uh, passed away. So it was a pretty rough 10 days there because uh, Ron was another extraordinary man, very big military supporter, huge military supporter, uh, wonderful guy. Yeah, I, that and Bill Wyndham, another wonderful man that was part of the, he played Dr. Seth um, Hazlitt and, and uh, yeah, rough, rough week. Yeah. And you often pay tribute on social media to longtime actors and directors who have passed, whether you w worked with them or not. How important is mm -hmm. it to honor the legends in your field? Well, again, I, I said off camera before we went on that I'm not huge on social media. I'm not that good at it. And uh, but it, you know, the, these people that that have been so um, inspirational and such a huge part of the business that I'm in, I just feel like they deserve uh, my thanks. They deserve to be memorialized. Uh, they've given us all so much they've provided us with entertainment and inspiration so i don't know i i just and, and many of those people i knew and had worked with some were actual friends and uh, you know when they pass it's just kind of what, what can you do i i don't know the families of, of these people not all of them but some of them i do so it's just my way of memorializing them and giving them the respect that I feel they're due. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And a show you know, of appreciation for them, you know. Yeah, no, that's awesome that you do that because, um, you know, while we're here on this earth, uh, you know, we we all kind of take from from the environment we're in and people that we've met along the way or people that we've kind of admired along the way. And we take a little bit and, and make it a part of ourselves. So I think that's uh, uh, a touching tribute. We appreciate you for for uh, for showing love to the legends. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and kind of, My pleasure. Thank you. And along the same lines as legends, can you let us know how Steve McQueen's bullet inspired you to go into show business? Uh, and, and how cool is it to restore a car like the one uh, McQueen drove in the movie? Uh, okay, so yes, Steve McQueen. Uh, most people, when I talk about this, think that Steve McQueen himself inspired me to go into show business. And uh, while he was definitely a part of that, uh, it was really the, the bullet chasing that inspired me to go into show business because my dad took me took me to see that film and I walked out of the film and uh, I said, uh, you know, I want to, so what I want to do when I grow up. And he said, you want to be in movies? I said, I want to drive cars like that in movies. So I re my goal was to be a stuntman, um, specializing in driving. And uh, I followed that through school. And after I finished high school, I started working at a men's clothing store and they asked me to do some modeling for them, which I did. And that led to me getting an agent in Baton Rouge, which led to TV commercials. 
and which eventually led to that agent, D. Cawthorn, putting a play into my hand and said, go read for this at the Baton Rouge Little Theater. Uh, it was called The Rainmaker, a wonderful play by N. Richard Nash. And I, I sucked up the courage to do it. I didn't think I was ready for it, but I, I sucked up the courage to do it. And uh, I ended up getting the lead in the, in the play and it changed my life. I, I realized that, you know, this is something that, that I was uh, capable of and that I enjoyed. And so I pursued that more vigorously. And I'd say with just over a year after doing that, not, not even a year after doing that play, I moved to Los Angeles and, and I've been able to do some stunts too. So I got, I got to do both of them, both of my loves. Um, I'm more uh, adept at acting than stunts now, but I almost always do all my fight scenes because I box for years. Uh, as far as the restoring of the car, I always wanted to have one. And finally, um, a few years ago, I said, you know, it's time to get one. And so I, I bought a 68 fast a Mustang Fastback and it was blue. It was an automatic. And so I had to completely restore it. Now, if you look at that color, you, you can see the green. Um, I, I don't know why I did this in retrospect. I, I should have painted it the color that the which is Highland green, which the Mustang was, but there's so many clones. See there, it looks black. Uh, yeah. I painted it black forest green. It's supposed to look black in the, in the shade and green in the sunlight. But for whatever reason, the guy that painted it did something wrong and it looks more black than it does green. Uh, but there were so many out there, but otherwise it's exactly the same as the bullet. The interior is exactly the same. And, uh, so just one of those, dreams that you have and i was able to fulfill that one but i will i will give some i'll give everybody a little tip if you want a classic car buy it already refurbished don't buy it and refurbish it because <laughs> it's a, it's a pain, pain in the butt it sounds like it. it well it's like building a house or having your house yeah. remodeled you know it's exa almost exactly the same it hardly ever goes smoothly and never cost what you think it's going to cost. It's cost more. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've been acting for more than 40 years, but over the past decade, you've been especially busy with recurring roles in Home After Dark or Before Dark, excuse me. All Rise, mm -hmm. What If, Longmire, True Blood and more. So how do you maintain mm -hmm. an energy level that allows you to stay so busy? Well, it's becoming harder. <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest, to, to be honest, uh, when you have the opportunity to work on the shows like this, it, it's pretty easy to get the energy to and the, the stamina and the whatever it takes. Uh, sure, the older I get, the more complacent I get. Uh, we're, we're always most comfortable at home. Um, but, uh, you know, and I don't that that may you, you get you get to a point in your career, which, you, you know, some some times and luckily I, I feel like I have to where I can be a little more choosy about what I accept. Um, not a lot. I mean, I'm not trying to say that I'm, you know, I, I do get offers, but it's, it's, um, I don't know. I, I just have to, uh, take, take a look at the project itself and see how, uh, how it works into what I've done so far. Is it, is the character fun, the people I'm working with so forth? Sorry about that. Uh, but the projects that you mentioned, those were very easy to accept. And of course, some of them were quite a while back. Uh, but you know, like, again, I stay in shape. So the, the physicality of the stamina, whatever, that's not a problem. It's just a matter of who do you want to work with? And, and, um, and what the character is like in the script and the people, behind the project. That's really how I choose projects now for the most part. But are those projects you mentioned great, you know, what if, for example, to be able to work with Renee Zellweger, uh, she's just a, just such a joy, such a sweet, down to earth girl. She really is. Um, you know, it's hard to say no to something like that, you know, <laughs> Yeah. And what, Who wouldn't want what to work some, with her? 
Well, you, and you they know, had me at Renee Zellweger. Right. Okay, so sorry. a side note about Renee Zellweger, random. So we're in Dallas and um, this was a while ago when I just got out of college and I moved back home because that's what you're supposed to do after college. Um, and I moved back home and I was living with my mom and I didn't have a job and it was the best years of my life. And I just laid at the pool all day and Renee nice. Zellweger, and it was a community pool and she was laying at our pool. And so I guess like, her mother-in-law had a house in the neighborhood and she was just hanging out. And I was like, oh, they are normal and just like us. <laughs> so, she, it was awesome. She, and she was nice. That, yeah, well, she's from, I think she's from Katy, Texas, or she's from, I think she lives in Austin now, in fact. I, I could be wrong. But um, no, that's that does not surprise me in the least. Sounds just like her. You yeah, know, I know. She's awesome. that down to earth. Yeah, she's she's a, a that's, really nice, that's... nice person. Um, and I misspoke, not her mother-in-law, her brother's mother-in-law. You, you know, the neighborhood talked after that to figure out what, you know, <laughs> everyone likes to talk to know the scoop. But what are some projects you've done that you wished uh, more people would discover? Hmm. Well, I've produced several independent feature films that never really got uh, their due. Um, that that was, uh, but that was before the whole film and so many different platforms uh, probably would be a little bit different today. So I would like for those to have gotten seen by a few more people. Um, but you mentioned, for example, Home Before Dark, which was a, an Apple TV series I did a few years ago up in Vancouver. And I thought it was such a wonderful show. Um, Brooklyn Prince was the lead. I mean, the first season, years old, and she's an absolute revelation. She was so good in that show. And it was a family show. It was good for adults and kids. And we don't get a whole lot of that. We, we got two seasons out of it. Uh, but um, so I would very much would have loved to have seen that go further. I mean, even if I wasn't in it, I, I would love to have seen that go further. It deserved it. But um, I don't know. Um, I, I think I've been fairly, fairly fortunate that most of the things that I've done uh, have seen, a, you know, gotten a pretty decent audience. Awesome. And so uh, for those that don't know, your father was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, and you've often expressed support uh, for the military uh, on social media. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of tell us the life of a, of an Air Force brat, uh, and, and how that <laughs> kind of shaped your view on the military? Yeah, well, my dad was, uh, he was a CBI pilot. He flew the hump in World War II and, uh, flew C-46s, C-47s. And, uh, you know, he, by the time that I was born, he was in the, the reserves. He stayed in the reserves most of his life. Um, and, you know, he was strict. He, he, it wasn't like the great Santini where we had to line up for, uh, for <laughs> inspection or anything like that, but he was a strict uh, father, but, uh, but you know, that, that discipline that he had, I think, uh, held me and, and my sisters in good stead. He was also, you know, he was a pilot. He was also a gunsmith. Uh, he did a lot of match shooting. He wasn't much of a hunter, uh, but we did a lot of match shooting. I was shooting, uh, learning gun safety and how to handle guns before I started school even. And, uh, so he was, um, so that whole, you know, sort of disciplinarian, uh, attitude, it was something that we all grew up with. Uh, but also my, my mother's brother, my uncle, uh, Whitney Philip Oakland Jr. He was born in, 1920. So after he graduated high school, uh, he wanted to go straight into the Air Force or the the Army Air Corps and uh, fly for them uh, at the beginning of the war. But you needed to have two years of college to fly for the U United States. So he and a bunch of uh, American boys went up to Canada. And so he flew for the Royal Canadian Air Force. And then on April 26 of 43, he was patrolling the Patrician Islands off the coast of Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And his plane went down. Uh, they never found it, never found him. Uh, so yeah, we, and my mother was a wave, 
during the Second World War. Um, my grandfather, my mother's father, uh, Captain Whitney, uh, Philip O'Quinn, he, he, I'm pretty sure he was in World War I. He died when I was young, and I didn't get a whole lot of history about him, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm pretty sure he served in World War I. Uh, but he was a captain, uh, a riverboat captain. He, would, uh, he piloted the riverboat between Baton Rouge and Port Allen before the big bridge was put in there in, in Baton Rouge. And we used to, uh, my sisters and I used to help, help him pilot the boat across the river. <laughs> so, Believe it or not. So you grew up in the great, great state of Louisiana? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? I, I did. Baton Rouge. Okay. Well, Baton that's, Rouge, that's, Louisiana, I'm a, born and raised. I, I knew I like you. I knew there was a good reason that I like you. Uh, I'm. I'm from Shreveport, Louisiana, and so uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. go go Tigers. <laughs> go Tigers. Did you watch that game last week? I did watch the game. It was it was How it was about. amazing. Loved it. If they can do that to Alabama, I'll even take a one one point win over Alabama. Be fine. Oh no, no, listen. That, that's our national championship. <laughs> we could be Alabama. That's our that's our national championship. Forget about anything else. I'm telling you, man. Well, you know, they got, well, Tennessee is. Tennessee. Rough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tennessee. Tennessee. And Georgia, uh, well, Georgia. I mean, Tennessee. our schedule, Georgia, Tennessee, A&M, our, the schedule, LSU schedule is by far the the, the most difficult. What, A&M? Yes. You know, you, <laughs> you know, you uh, Georgia, yeah. Uh, LSU schedule that from here on out is the toughest by far in the SEC, by far. So, yeah. you know, but what, regardless of what happens this year, well, they're, they're certainly building a, a heck of a team. I hope some of my peeps are watching back in Baton Rouge right now. Oh, yeah. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. <laughs> well, speaking of your peeps watching, you do have a lot of comments in our live feed right now, so I'll just read a few. So Alicia, okay. Breyer, and Kathy are all saying hello. How are you? Robert wants to know about your background. He says it's really cool. He sees a lot of paintings and books. So can you tell us a bit more about the books you have in your collection behind you? Oh, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Um, well, this one, let me see this one. Wait, it's backwards. So this yeah, book yeah, right yeah. there, that is, uh, that's, uh, Mr. New Orleans, which was written by a bat, well, a, a New Orleans native, Matthew Randazzo, the fifth. And that is a, an extraordinary book. Any Louisiana person should read that book. It's about uh, uh, a low-level mobster back in the day from the 50s all the way through the, uh, I think the book goes all the way into the maybe the 90s, uh, called Frenchy Brule. And it is an extraordinary book. It's such a fun read. I actually did the, uh, the audio book for that book. Um, so that's one of my... Uh, favorite books. I, I keep it uh, front and center. A lot of my books are, um, I was very, you know, there, I think Jaws is there. And um, there's a lot of books that on, on some of our political uh, people of the past, uh, I like reading about, you know, some of the things that happened back in the shadows. Those kind of things interest me. So some people may call them conspiracy theories. Uh, uh, I, I, anything that has a big question mark after it, I, I, I like to read about because I, yes. I find that um, you have to, you have to look at both sides of all issues to, you know, and then figure out what is true, at least for you for yourself. But uh, you know, no, some right. novels, yeah. Now, speaking of things in the shadows, <laughs> not in a bad way, but I love classic movies. And I recently watched Gaslight, which Angela's actually in. Um, and I also noticed in her career, so I'm young, of course, but my grandma would yes. always have me watch movies she wrote as a kid growing up. And so to kind of see Angela in a few other films I've watched too, that were back in like the 40s, 30s, that type of thing. And to see her, you know, in the 80s with Murder, She Wrote, you can see such um, growth in her acting. So I have a question for you about your career. What kind of thoughts mm -hmm. and reflections do you have on your own evolution with acting since you've been acting for such a long time now? Mm. It's a great question. Um, you, 
I think actors, for the most part, we use our life experiences. We call on our life experiences. At least I do. And I well, all actors do. That's not really a secret. And what we do as actors, we just recreate what we do every waking hour of every day. Um, most uh, actors, there's a, there's a saying, if you get caught acting, then you're not doing a good job. You shouldn't be able to catch somebody, somebody acting. It really should, you try to be, you know, I came from stage, stage is bigger than life and film is sometimes even smaller than life. You have to be even smaller. And, but for the most part, it's just recreating what, what we're doing right now. We're just talking. We, I listen to you, I hear it, I react to it. And so the, the longer you go through life, the more experiences you have in life, the more you have to call on when you read the script and you have to do something that you have experienced in your life, you know what that feels like. And I also believe that just like anything, like in sports, muscle memory, golf, golf swing, anything, once you have tapped into your emotions at, at, from doing it for so many years, regardless of what that emotion is, uh, it just comes a little bit more easily at least it, it did for me and i think for most actors that's why i i can remember the very first thing that i did on film it was a uh <clears throat> somebody's probably gonna dig it up and put it online and embarrass the hell out of me but uh it was a it was a it was a uh, uh what do you call it an industrial film called can capitalism survive and it was done by the L lbp uh Louisiana broadcast public LPB or whatever. And it was a Louisiana produced thing. I played a character by the name of Goomby. I just remember that it was a silly character. <laughs> and I remember going to, it was like my first thing. I was like, I'm going to act. And I, Oh, I got this thing. I auditioned for it. I got it. Then I went to the, to the screening of it. And I was like, Oh my, I was horrible just horrible. And I had taken one acting class uh, with a, a woman named Barbara Cheney at D. Cawthorns, uh, who was my agent. And I said, uh, I said, Barbara, I was, I was horrible in that. She goes, well, but you, you, you look great. And you, you were sort of natural. <laughs> and I'm like, that sounds but like, so, bless, so, bless you know, <laughs> exactly. It's that very much like that. <laughs> exactly bless your heart but that you know that's uh i mean listen look at uh you know arnold schwarzenegger look at his first movie and then look at some of the yeah. things that he's done i mean i'm not saying he's a he'll probably never win an oscar but he got better and there are other actors you can look at through their career you just you just get it you know you get it and i i'd say for young actors and younger or, or starting out actors, regardless of the age, you know, one day, and I tell my daughter this because she wants to act, is that you work on these things, you got to, whatever you, you won't get any more out of it than you put into it. So you have to, you have to really work at it, but one day it'll click and you'll go, that's it. And then from there, you build on that. Man, I'm, I'm waiting on that moment still. <laughs> are you i don't know man i think you got it bro i think you got it oh, no i appreciate that yeah pleasure you know, so vanessa also says she's a huge longmire fan and she's really enjoyed your role in westworld and your new show as corbell pickett um and then marisa also says go tigers there we go all right Marissa. we go looking tigers. good right now we're looking good <laughs> We are looking good. And look, if you think about it, is that that one extra point, we'd be, what, six and one? Yeah. Instead of five and one. But we're number one in the out, SEC. If, Say again. But if we win all the way out, we, there's no way that we're not in the in the, in the, in the chip yet. Well, in the in the playoff series. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So. Yeah. If we, well, if we win the SEC championship, we'll, we'll be in there, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, but you know, listen, man, you know, that that's, uh, that's a gauntlet with well, it for it's it. Well, it's that, that hard, heart attack kids, you know, sometimes <laughs> yeah. over the years, LSU, you know, lately they've been well, and, but listen, no matter what happens, 
we got the 2019 season, the best college se- season of football in history. In history, I don't think anybody absolutely. will ever break that. In history. In a a history. thousand percent. Go Joe. Go Joe. <laughs> now I'm a big Bengals fan, too. <laughs> well, no, I, I got Joe. I got Joe and Chase on my fantasy football team, and they and I'm doing pretty good. Uh, that's a good combination. Yeah, yeah, heck yeah, absolutely. And you got some more coming up in LSU. Sorry, Emily. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Oh, yeah, we, we, we just um, hijacked the interview to talk about no. LSU. I just hope one day you guys get smarter and know to you know root for the Aggies. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, those fighting words, Emily. Just <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I know you are. They're they're good. Um, they're good too. That that's going to be a tough game. I think that's our last game of the season, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it'll be yes. Um, and I'll be Lewis, thinking you about you, Emily, when we're. Thank you. Yes. While, yes. While we're, while we're beating our behinds. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll remember that. I'll give you a call if we win and just say, hey, okay. you remember Lewis? <laughs> I will. But Lewis, I, you mentioned earlier, you're, you're a huge social media guy. <laughs> just so where can, we find, <laughs> where can we find out more about your work and your causes? Well, I'm uh, my social media handle on Instagram and Twitter is that at Lewis underscore Hertham. And the reason it's Got the underscore is because somebody has my has at Lewis Hertham on Instagram and Twitter and they won't give it back to me. So um, everybody write and say, give Lewis Hertham his name because they're not doing anything with it. You know, so but anyway, and then Facebook, I have a Facebook page. Um, I had a fan page, but that got hacked and removed. So I just have a regular. Everyone wants to be you, Lewis. (laughs) Oh, no, nah, you know, it's the weirdest thing. That's, that's just, no, if you have, if you're like, have the slightest bit of notoriety, I guess, um, which I don't, you know, I, I don't f- live in that world of feeling like that. I really don't. Um, but it just baffles my mind why people would even bother it does, but <laughs> they do. Yeah. But that's Who where you can there? find me. Yeah. yeah. Whoever's squatting on Lewis's name, give it up. Get up, get off the pot. What are you doing? Yeah, really, man. You know, you could you you know squad bigger names. Of course, those are all taken too. I guess. But. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, for our Chief Chat viewers, you can find this episode as well as past Chief Chat episodes on YouTube and Spotify. Uh, you can tune in also at 11 a.m. Central on November 1st when our guest will be military photographer Jeff Reese. And also join us on 17 November at 1100 Central Standard Time when we bring you Medal of Honor recipient and author, Lieutenant General Retired Robert Foley. So Lewis, man, it's been been an awesome interview. Man, we we appreciate you. I'm glad to know I got a a fellow Louisiana in the the quad chart right now. It's it's amazing. Best state ever. My pleasure. We're not the we're not the smartest people in the world, but our personalities are like, bam, like explosive. So <laughs> that's us. There you go. I'll take Absolutely. personality over smarts any day. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> a thousand percent. No, but you got a lot of smarts you know, too. Just, you know it. We just really appreciate you you spending time with us today, and, and just knowing uh, that you've been in the biz. Of, you know, you've been in the show business or acting for. A, 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 over 40 years and and you know as mi- us as military folks you know we people like to thank us for our service and what we do and uh we, we thank you for for giving us that outlet to to kind of release from the craziness that we deal with on a day-to-day basis so you know giving us uh a little max headroom or a little uh you know <laughs> uh or De- deputy andy or just those things kind of put us through life right right where is that? <laughs> Where is it? I can't find it. There's a delay, so this is driving me crazy trying to gotcha. see this ring. Oh, wait, I do wait see the ring. Where is it? Perfect. There, there it okay, is. That's a, okay, this is driving me nuts. Okay, this way. Then. <laughs> yeah, right there. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I see our that is infantry. A, oh, I got it upside down. Yeah, it's a it's a uh, a vintage army 
army ring. I love vintage stuff. I love, as you can see, collectibles and stuff. And but I have a lot of uh, vintage uh, army. I have my one of the rings that my my uncle gave to my mother, the Royal Canadian Air Force. And yeah, so just like uh, so, you know, give them props. You know, my dad was in the Air Force, which started out, as you know, the Army Air Corps. So Army Air Corps, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we got a big game coming up too, uh, Army versus Air Force, and you know, hold on, what? Well, mm. Let me let me make sure I, that my, my my audience knows who I'm going for. Uh, yeah, go you Air Force. You can see that. Beat Army. Yeah, babe. <laughs> absolutely. But but that's the weird thing. They used to be part of one, sort of. Yeah. No. Anyway. No. We. We were definitely we were definitely the army's rib at some point and then we just that's dislocated right. that rib and started our own service that's right <laughs> but but no thank you so much again uh for having you with us if you don't mind hanging on till after the live can we so we can kind of say our formal goodbyes but i just want to tell sure. you know say thank you again uh for for spending the last 45 minutes with us and uh awesome conversation uh it, we're definitely gonna you, you got supporters here at the exchange uh, for whatever you do for the rest thank of your you. career. So thank you so much. Well, well, thank you. And I want to thank you all uh, so much for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I, I appreciate you very much. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, just hang on just a second for us, but uh, we'll, we'll end the yeah. show right here. So chat out. <laughs>